Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you so much for joining me today and for tuning in. For those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Rebecca Pierce, and I am a seventh grade English teacher in North Carolina. Um, and since we had to kind of end our school year a lot differently than what we had anticipated, I did not get a chance to teach my most favorite book of the entire school year, which is The Outsiders by Essie Hinton. And so what I think we're gonna do is we are going to do a read aloud version of the book and I'm gonna stop alone the way and kind of model what I call think alouds. I'm gonna pose some questions, um, things that we would normally have a discussion about if we were in class with all of my students. I'm gonna kind of still ask those questions and pose those thoughts as we read. Um, so the chapter might take a little bit longer to get through than normal, but hopefully for those of you who are watching, um, it will kind of give you some things to ponder and help you have some questions and think a little bit deeper about the book. So. Thank you for tuning in and for joining me. Um, and again, this is chapter one of The Outsiders by Essie Hinton. So here we go. I love this book. It is my absolute favorite. Here we go, chapter one. When I stepped out into the bright sunlight from the darkness of the movie house, I had only two things on my mind, Paul Newman and a ride home. I was wishing I looked like Paul Newman. He looks tough and I don't, but I guess my own looks aren't so bad. I have light brown, almost red hair and greenish gray eyes. I wish there were more gray because I hate most guys that have green eyes, but I have to be content with what I have. My hair is longer than a lot of boys wear theirs, squared off in the back and long at the front and sides, but I'm a greaser and most of my neighborhood rarely bothers to get a haircut. Besides, I look better with long hair. First thing, interesting, um, I note that this is definitely written in first person because I see those keywords like I, me, and my. So I know it's first person, but I'm almost like a page into this thing. I don't know what my main character's name is yet. I don't know what our protagonist, what his name is. But he talks a lot about his hair and he talks a lot about how he looks. So as a reader who's going to analyze this text, I'm going to just start thinking about, hmm, if right away on the first page, they're already talking about hair multiple times. And they're already talking about like physical appearance multiple times and I don't even know this dude's name. Might be something I'm gonna keep thinking about and just make a little note of every time those concepts pop up in the text because that's probably gonna lead to maybe some kind of a symbol or a theme or maybe just gonna be an important factor in the book as we go. So just kind of make a little note about that. All right, here we go, let's keep going. I had a long walk home in no company, but I usually loan it anyway for no reason except that I like to watch movies undisturbed so I can get into them and live them with the actors. When I see a movie with someone, it's kind of uncomfortable, like having someone read your book over your shoulder. I'm different that way. I mean, my second oldest brother, Soda, that's a weird name, who is 16 going on 17, never cracks a book at all. And my oldest brother, Daryl, who we call Derry, works too long and hard to be interested in a story or drawing a picture. So I'm not like them. And nobody in our gang digs movies and books the way that I do. For a while there, I thought I was the only person in the world that did. So I loaned it. Soda tries to understand, at least, which is more than Derry does. But then, Soda is different from anybody. He understands everything. Almost. Like, he's never hollering at me all the time the way the dairy is or treating me as if I was six instead of 14. I love Soda more than I've ever loved anyone, even mom and dad. He's always happy-go-lucky and grinning, while dairy's hard and firm and rarely grins at all. But then, dairy has gone through a lot in his 20 years, grown up too fast. Soda Pop will never grow up at all. I don't know which way's the best. I'll find out one of these days. So right now, what we have right there, I need to remember that that is kind of like a little bit of a flashback. And we know that in the exposition or like that beginning part of a novel, our author's gonna give us all of this information about our characters, our setting, and kind of set up the basics of this plot. So I know that in real time, as I like to call it, our character is walking home from the movies and as he is, his mind is just starting to wander and think about some different things. And we're learning that our character still don't know his name, but he has two brothers. One is named Derry or Daryl. Um, and the other one is named Soda Pop and they call him Soda. So 
definitely an interesting name there. Um, and if we were face to face, I would definitely have us stop for a minute and write down each of our characters that we've learned about so far and some of their character traits because our authors revealed a lot to us about these characters in just two pages as far as who they are as people, if they were real people, um, their character traits, and then as well as also a little bit about their physical appearance. So I'm just going to keep making note of that um, as we keep reading here. All right, we're towards the bottom of page two. Anyway, I went on walking home, thinking about the movie, and then suddenly wishing I had some company. Greasers can't walk home, walk alone too much, or they'll get jumped, or someone will come by and scream, Greaser! at them, which doesn't make you feel too hot, if you know what I mean. We get jumped by the socias. I'm not sure how you spell it, but it's the abbreviation for the socials, the jet set, the west side rich kids. It's like the term greaser, which is used to class all us boys on the east side. All right, sounds to me like we're getting set up for a little bit of a conflict here. Got east side, west side, greasers versus socials. Interesting, and they've used the word gang a few times, so I don't know, let's see where this goes. We are poorer than the socias in the middle class. I reckon we're wilder too. Not like the socias who jump greasers and wreck houses and throw beer baths beer blasts for kicks, and get editorials in the paper for being a public disgrace one day and an asset to society the next. Greasers are almost like hoods. We steal things and drive old souped up cars and hold up gas stations and have a gang fight once in a while. I don't mean I do things like that. Terry would kill me if I got into trouble with the police. Since mom and dad were killed in an auto wreck, that's sad, since mom and dad were killed in an auto wreck, the three of us get to stay together only as long as we behave. So Soda and I stay out of trouble as much as we can, and we're careful not to get caught when we can't. I only mean that most greasers do things like that. Just like we wear our hair long and dress in blue jeans and t-shirts, or leave our shirt tails out and wear leather jackets and tennis shoes or boots. I'm not saying that either socias or greasers are better. That's just the way things are. I could have waited to go to the movies until Dairy or Soda Pop got off work. They would have gone with me or driven me there or walked along. Although Soda just can't sit still long enough to enjoy a movie and they bore Dairy to death. Dairy thinks his life is enough without inspecting other people's. Or I could have gotten one of the gang to come along. One of the four boys Dairy and Soda and I have grown up with and consider family. We're almost as close as brothers. When you grow up in a tight-knit neighborhood like ours, you get to know each other real well. If I had thought about it, I could have called Derry and he would have come by on his way home and picked me up. Or two Vit Matthews, one of our gang, would have come to get me in his car if I'd asked him. But sometimes I just don't use my head. It drives my brother Derry nuts when I do stuff like that because I'm supposed to be smart. I make good grades and have a high IQ and everything but I don't use my head. Besides, I like walking. Interesting. So it definitely sounds like this character is a loner and it seems like he's doing a lot of comparing and contrasting of himself to the rest of the gang, even though they're people that he's close with. Seems like he's a lot different than them. And I don't know if that's gonna be a good thing for him or a bad thing for him, but he's very aware of it, which is interesting to know. Here we go. I about decided I didn't like it so much though when I spotted that red Corvair trailing me. I was almost two blocks from home then, so I started walking a little faster. I had never been jumped, but I had seen Johnny after four socias got hold of him, and it wasn't pretty. Johnny was scared of his own shadow after that. Johnny was 16 then. I knew it wasn't any use though, the fast walking. I mean, even before the Corvair pulled up beside me and five socias got out. I got pretty scared. I'm kind of small for 14, even though I have a good build, and those guys were bigger than me. I automatically hitched my thumb in my jeans and slouched, wondering if I could get away if I made a break for it. I remember Johnny, his face all cut up and bruised, and I remember how he had cried when we found him, half conscious in the corner lot. Johnny had it awful rough at home, it took a lot to make him cry. I was sweating something fierce, although I was cold. I could feel my palms getting clammy and the perspiration running down my back. I get like that when I'm real scared. 
I glanced around for a pop bottle or a stick or something. Steve Randall, so does Best Buddy, had once held off four guys with a busted pop bottle, but there was nothing. So I stood there like a bump on a log while they surrounded me. I don't use my head. They walked around, slowly, silently, smiling. Okay, um, that last line there, slowly, silently, smiling. Try saying that five times fast. But that repetition of that S sound, that is what we call an alliteration. And right there, think about it. What sound, or what animal should I say, is that sound mimicking the slowly, silently, smiling? If you have one kid and he's in the middle of these other socias walking all around him, then that s sound. Think about what your author's trying to allude to there. Um, but I don't think this is going to go too well for, for our main character here. And I just finished page four. We still don't know his name, but we know all these other people's names. Interesting. Let's see what happens to him. Hey, Grease, one said in an overly friendly voice. We're going to do you a favor, Greaser. We're going to cut all that long, greasy hair off. He had on a Madras shirt. I can still see it. Blue Madras. One of them laughed, then cussed me out in a low voice. I couldn't think of anything to say. There just isn't a whole lot you can say while waiting to get mugged. So I kept my mouth shut. Need a haircut, Greaser? The medium-sized blonde pulled a knife out of his back pocket and flipped the blade open. I finally thought of something to say. No. I was backing, backing up away from that knife. Of course, I backed right into one of them. They had me down in a second. They had my arms and legs pinned down, and one of them was sitting on my chest with his knees on my elbows. And if you don't think that hurts, you're crazy. I could smell English leather, shaving lotion, and stale tobacco. And I wondered foolishly if I would suffocate before they did anything. I was scared so bad I was wishing I would. I fought to get loose and almost did for a second, but then they tightened up on me and the one with my chest, the one on my chest slugged me a couple of times. So I lay still, swearing at them between gasps. A blade was held against my throat. How'd you like that hair cut to begin just below the chin? It occurred to me then that they could kill me. Do you think that they're going to kill him? We're on page five and is our main character. Do you think he's going to die yet? No, I hope you said no. That just would not make sense. Okay. It occurred to me then that they could kill me. I went wild. I started screaming for soda, dairy, anyone. Someone put his hand over my mouth and I bit it as hard as I could tasting blood running through my teeth. I heard a muttered curse and got slugged again, and they were stuffing a handkerchief in my mouth. One of them kept saying, shut him up, for Pete's sake, shut him up. Then there were shouts and the pounding of feet, and the socials jumped up and left me lying there, gasping. I lay there and wondered what in the world was happening. People were jumping over me and running by me, and I was too dazed to figure it out. Then someone had me under the armpits and was hauling me to my feet. It was dairy. Are you all right, pony boy? He was shaking me and I wished he'd stop. I was dizzy enough anyway. I could tell it was dairy though, partly because of his voice and partly because dairy's always rough with me without meaning to be. I, I'm okay, quit shaking me, dairy, I'm okay. He stopped instantly, I'm sorry. He wasn't really. Dairy isn't ever sorry for anything he does. It seems funny to me that he should look just exactly like my father and act exactly the opposite from him. My father was only 40 when he died and he looked 25. And a lot of people thought Derry and dad were brothers instead of father and son. But they only looked alike. My father was never rough with anyone without meaning to be. Derry is six feet two and broad shouldered and muscular. He has dark brown hair that kicks out in front of, in, kicks out in front and a slight cowlick in the back, just like dad's. But Derry's eyes are his own. He's got eyes that are like two pieces of pale blue green ice. They've got a determined set to them, like the rest of him. He looks older than 20, tough, cool, and smart. He would be real handsome if his eyes weren't so cold. 
He doesn't understand anything that is not plain hard fact, but he uses his head. I sat down again, rubbing my cheek where I'd been slugged the most. Derry jammed his fists into his pockets. They didn't hurt you too bad, did they? They did. I was smarting and aching and my chest was sore and I was so nervous my hands were shaking and I wanted to start bawling. But you just don't say that to Derry. I'm okay. Soda pop came looping back. By then, I had figured that all the noise I'd heard was the gang coming to rescue me. He dropped down beside me, examining my head. You got cut up a little, huh, pony boy? Wait, what's this dude saying? Pony boy? Okay. I only looked at him blankly. I did? He pulled out a handkerchief, wet the end of it with his tongue, and pressed it gently against the side of my head. You're bleeding like a stuck pig. I am? Look. He showed me the handkerchief, reddened as if by magic. Did they pull a blade on you? I remember the voice. Need a haircut, greaser? The blade must have slipped while he was trying to shut me up. Yeah. Soda is a handsomer than anyone else I know. Not like Derry. Soda's movie star kind of handsome. The kind that people stop on the street to watch go by. He's not as tall as Derry, and he's a little slimmer. But he has a finely drawn, sensitive face that somehow manages to be reckless and thoughtful at the same time. He's got dark gold hair that he combs back long and silky and straight, and in the summer, the sun bleaches it to a shining wheat gold. His eyes are dark brown, lively, dancing, recklessly laughing eyes that can be gentle and sympathetic one moment and blazing with anger the next. He has dad's eyes, but Soda is one of a kind. He can get drunk in a drag race or dancing without ever getting near alcohol. In our neighborhood, it's rare to find a kid who doesn't drink once in a while. But Soda never touches a drop. He doesn't need to. He gets drunk on just plain living. And he understands everybody. He looked at me more closely. I looked away hurriedly because, if you want to know the truth, I was starting to bawl. I knew I was as white as I felt and was shaking like a leaf. Soda just put his hand on my shoulder. Easy, pony boy. They ain't gonna hurt you no more. I know, I said. But the ground began to blur and I felt hot tears running down my cheeks. I brushed them away impatiently. I'm just a little spooked, that's all. I drew a quivering breath and, did, and quit crying. You just don't cry in front of Derry. Not unless you're hurt like Johnny had been that day we found him in the vacant lot. Compared to Johnny, I wasn't hurt at all. Soda rubbed my hair. You're an okay kid, pony. I had to grin at him. Soda can make you grin no matter what. I guess it's because he's always grinning so much himself. You're crazy, Soda, out of your mind. Derry looked as if he'd like to knock our heads together. You're both nuts. Soda merely cocked one eyebrow, a trick he'd picked up from Two Bit. It seems to run in this family. Derry stared at him for a second, then cracked a grin. Soda Pop isn't afraid of him like everyone else and enjoys teasing him. I'd just as soon tease a full-grown grizzly, but for some reason, Derry seems to like being teased by Soda. Our gang had chased the Socias to their car and heaved rocks at them. They came running towards us now, four lean, hard guys. They were all as tough as nails and looked it. I had grown up with them, and they accepted me, even though I was younger, because I was Derry and Soda's kid brother, and I kept my mouth shut good. Steve Randall was 17. Tall and lean with thick, greasy hair, he kept combed in complicated swirls. He was cocky, smart, and so his best buddy since grade school. Steve's specialty was cars. He could lift a hubcap quicker and more quietly than anyone in the neighborhood. But he also knew cars upside down and backwards and could drive anything on wheels. He and Soto worked at the same gas station, Steve part-time and Soto full-time, and their station got more customers than any other in town. Whether that was because Steve was so good with cars or because Soda attracted girls like Honey Draws Flies, I couldn't tell you. I liked Steve only because he was Soda's best friend. He didn't like me. He thought I was, uh, 
tag along and a kid. Soda always took me with them when they went places if they were taking girls, and that bugged Steve. It wasn't my fault. Soda always asked me. I didn't ask him. Soda doesn't think I'm a kid. Tudit Matthews was the oldest of the gang and the wisecracker of the bunch. He was about six feet tall, stocky and build, and very proud of his long, rusty-colored sideburns. He had gray eyes and a wide grin, and he couldn't stop making funny remarks to save his life. You couldn't shut that guy up. He always had to get his two bits worth in. Hence his name. Even his teachers forgot his real name was Keith, and we hardly remembered he had one. Life was one big joke to Tubit. He was famous for shoplifting and his black-handled switchblade, which he couldn't have acquired without his first talent. And he was always smarting off to the cops. He really couldn't help it. Everything he said was so irresistibly funny that he just had to let the police in on it to brighten up their dull lives. That's the way he explained it to me. He liked fights, blondes, and for some unfathomable reason, school. He was still a junior at 18 and a half, and he never learned anything. He just went for kicks. I liked him real well because he kept us laughing at ourselves as well as at other things. He reminded me of Will Rogers. Maybe it was the grin. If I had to pick the real character of the gang, it would be Dallas Winston. Dally. I used to like to draw his picture when he was in a dangerous mood, for then I could get his personality down in a few lines. He had an elfish face with high cheekbones and a pointed chin, small, sharp animal teeth, and ears like a lynx. His hair was almost white, it was so blonde, and he didn't like haircuts or hair oil either, so it fell all over his forehead in wisps and kicked out in the back in tufts and curled behind his ears and along the nape of his neck. His eyes were blue, blazing ice, cold with a hatred of the whole world. Deli had spent three years on the west side of New York and had been arrested at the age of 10. He was tougher than the rest of us, tougher, colder, meaner. The shade of difference that separates a greaser from a hood wasn't present in Dally. He was as wild as the boys in the downtown outfits, like Tim Shepard's gang. So what I would have us do if we were in class is we would pause right here and we would go ahead and fill out a little chart with what we just learned about each of those characters because we learned a lot, not just about their character description, meaning their physical appearance of what they look like on the outside, but we also learned quite a bit about each character's character traits or like those personality traits, of what we would call them if they're real people um, and who they are as characters. So we would definitely pause right there and kind of map all of that out. Um, but we're going to just keep reading today. Um, we're on page 11 now. In New York, Dally blew off steam in gang fights, but here, organized gangs are rarities. There are just small bunches of friends who stick together, and the warfare is between the social classes. A rumble, when it's called, is usually born of a grudge fight, and the opponents just happen to bring their friends along. Oh, there are a few named gangs around, like the River Kings and the Tiber Street Tigers, but here in the Southwest, there's no gang rivalry. So Dally, even though he could get into a good fight sometimes, had no specific thing to hate. No rival gang only Soches. And you can't win against them no matter how hard you try, because they've got all the breaks and even whipping them isn't going to change that fact. Maybe that's why Dallas was so bitter. He had quite a reputation. They have a file on him down at the police station. He had been arrested, he got drunk, he rode in rodeos, lied, cheated, stole, rolled, dr rolled drunks, jumped small kids. He did everything. I didn't like him. But he was smart and you had to respect him. Johnny Cade was the last and least. If you can picture a little dark puppy that has been kicked too many times and is lost in a crowd of strangers, you have Johnny. He was the youngest next to me, smaller than the rest with a slight build. He had big black eyes in a dark tan face. His hair was jet black and heavily greased and combed to the side, but it was so long that it fell in shaggy bangs across his forehead. He had a nervous, suspicious look in his eyes, and that beating he got from the socias didn't help matters. He was the gang's pet, everyone's kid brother. 
His father was always beating him up, and his mother ignored him, except when she was hacked off at something, and then he could hear her yelling at him clear down at our house. I think he hated that worse than getting whipped. He would have run away a million times if he hadn't been there. If it hadn't been for the gang, Johnny would never have known what love and affection are. That's really sad. I wiped my eyes hurriedly. Did you catch him? No, nope. they got away this time. The dirty two-bit went on cheerfully, calling the socias every name he could think of or make up. The kid's okay? I'm okay. I tried to think of something to say. I'm usually pretty quiet around people, even the gang. I changed the subject. I didn't know you were out of the cooler yet, Dally. What do you think the cooler is? <laughs> Good behavior. Got off early. Dallas lit a cigarette and handed it to Johnny. Everyone sat down to have a smoke and relax. A smoke always lessens the tension. I had quit trembling and my color was back. The cigarette was calming me down. Tubit cocked an eyebrow. Nice looking bruise you got there, kid. I touched my cheek gingerly. Really? Tubit nodded sagely. Nice cut, too. Makes you look tough. Tough and tough are two different words. Tough is the same as rough. Tough means cool, sharp, like a tough-looking Mustang or a tough record. In our neighborhood, both are compliments. So as we're kind of learning more about the setting of this novel, um, picking up on the fact that there's things like teenagers in gangs and fights and they drink and they smoke um, and things like being tough and tough, the two versions of it that they have here in the book, our compliments um, kind of really paints a picture of what kind of a neighborhood these characters are living in. Here we go, page 13. Steve flicked his ashes at me. What were you doing walking by your lonesome? Leave it to good old Steve to bring up something like that. I was coming home from the movies. I didn't think. You don't ever think, Derry broke in. Not at home or anywhere when it counts. You must think at school with all those good grades you bring home, and you've always got your nose in a book, but do you ever use your head for common sense? No, sirree, bub. And if you did have to go by yourself, you should have carried a blade. I just stared at the hole in the toe of my tennis shoe. Me and Derry just didn't dig each other. I never could please him. He would have hollered at me for carrying a blade if I had carried one. If I brought home B's, he wanted A's, and if I got A's, he wanted to make sure they stayed A's. If I was playing football, I should be in studying. And if I was reading, I should be out playing football. He never hollered at Soda Pop, not even when Soda dropped out of school or got tickets for speeding. He just hollered at me. I don't think things are really good on that front between those two. Soda was glaring at him. Leave my kid brother alone, you hear? It ain't his fault he likes to go to the movies and it ain't his fault the socials like to jump us. And if he had been carrying a blade, it would have been a good excuse to cut him to ribbons. Soda always takes up for me. Derry said impatiently, When I want my kid brother to tell me what to do with my other kid brother, I'll ask you. Kid brother. But he laid off me. He always does when Soda Pop tells him to. Most of the time. Next time, get one of us to go with you, Pony Boy, Tubit said. Any of us will. Speaking of movies, Dally yawned, flipping away his cigarette butt. I'm walking over to the nightly double tomorrow night. Anybody want to come and hunt some action? Steve shook his head. Me and Soda are picking up Evie and Sandy for the game. He didn't need to look at me the way he did right then. I wasn't going to ask if I should come. I'd never tell Soda because he really likes Steve a lot, but sometimes I can't stand Steve Randall. I mean it. Sometimes I hate him. Derry sighed, just like I knew he would. Derry never had time to do anything anymore. I'm working tomorrow night. Dally looked at the rest of us. How about y'all? Tubit, Johnny Cake, you and Pony want to come? Me and Johnny will come, I said. I knew Johnny wouldn't open his mouth unless he was forced to. Okay, Derry? Yeah, since it ain't a school night. Derry was real good about letting me go places on the weekends. On school nights, I could hardly leave the house. 
I was planning on getting boozed up tomorrow night, Tubit said. If I don't, I'll walk over and find y'all. Steve was looking at Dally's hand. His ring, which he had rolled a drunk senior to get, was back on his finger. You rake up with Sylvia again? Yeah, and this time it's for good. That little broad was two-timing me while I was in jail. I thought of Sylvia and Evie and Sandy, and two bits many blondes. They were the only kind of girls that would look at us, I thought. Tough, loud girls who wore too much eye makeup and giggled and swore too much. I liked Soda's girl Sandy just fine, though. Her hair was natural blonde and her laugh was soft, like her china blue eyes. She didn't have a real good home or anything and was our kind, greaser. But she was a real nice girl. Still, lots of times I wondered what other girls were like. The girls who were bright-eyed and had their dresses a decent length and acted as if they'd like to spit on us if given the chance. Some were afraid of us, and remembering Dallas Winston, I didn't blame them. But most of us, but most looked at us like we were dirt, gave us the same kind of look that the socias did when they came by in the, their Mustangs and Corvairs and yelled, Grease! at us. I wondered about them, the girls, I mean. Did they even cry when their boys were arrested, like Evie did when Soda got hauled in? Or did they run out on them the way Sylvia did Dallas? But maybe their boys didn't get arrested or beaten up or busted up in rodeos. I was still thinking about it while I was doing my homework that night. I had to read Great Expectations for English, and that kid Pip, he reminded me of us. The way he felt marked lousy because he wasn't a gentleman or anything, and the way that girl kept looking down on him. That happened to me once. One time in biology, I had to dissect a worm, and the razor wouldn't cut, so I used my switchblade. The minute I flicked it out, I forgot what I was doing, or I never would have done it. This girl right beside me kind of gasped, and she said, they are right. You are a hood. That didn't make me feel so hot. There were a lot of socials in that class. I get put up into A classes because I'm supposed to be smart, and most of them thought it was pretty funny. I didn't, though. She was a cute girl. She looked real good in yellow. We deserve a lot of our trouble, I thought. Dallas deserves everything he gets, and should get worse if you want the truth. And two bit, he doesn't really want or need half the things he swipes from stores. He just thinks it's fun to swipe everything that isn't nailed down. I can understand why Soda Pop and Steve get into drag races and fight so much, though. Both of them have too much energy, too much feeling, with no way to blow it off. Rub harder, Soda, I heard Derry mumbling. You're going to put me to sleep. I looked through the door. Soda Pop was giving Derry a back rub. Derry is always pulling muscles. He roofs houses, and he's always trying to carry two bundles of roofing up the ladder. I knew Soda would put him to sleep because Soda can put about anyone out when he puts his head to it. He thought Derry worked too hard anyway. I did too. Derry didn't deserve to work like an old man when he was only 20. He had been a real popular guy in school. He was the captain of the football team, and he had been voted boy of the year. But we just didn't have the money for him to go to college even with the athletic scholarship he won. And now he didn't have time between jobs to even think about college. So he never went anywhere, never did anything anymore, except work out at gyms and go skiing with some old friends of his sometimes. I rubbed my cheek where it had turned purple. I had looked in the mirror and it did make me look tough, but Derry had made me put a bandaid on the cut. I remembered how awful Johnny had looked when he got beaten up. I had just as much right to use the streets as the socialists did, and Johnny had never hurt them. Why did the socialists hate us so much? We left them alone. I nearly went to sleep over my homework, trying to figure it out. Soda Pop, who had jumped into bed by this time, yelled sleepily for me to turn off the light and get to bed. When I finished the chapter I, I was on, I did. Lying beside Soda, staring at the wall, I kept remembering the faces of the socialists as they surrounded me that blue Madra shirt that blonde was wearing, and I could still hear a thick voice. Need a haircut, greaser? I shivered. You cold, funny boy? A little, I lied. Soda threw one arm across my neck. He mumbled something drowsily. Listen, kiddo, when Derry hollers at you, he don't mean nothing. 
He's just got more worries than somebody who can stay talk to. Don't take him serious. You dig, Pony? Don't let him bug you. He's really proud of you because you're so brainy. It's just because you're the baby. I, I mean, he loves you a lot. Savvy? Sure, I said, trying for soda's sake to keep the sarcasm out of my voice. Soda? Yeah. How come you dropped it out? I never have gotten over that. I could hardly stand it when he left school. Cause I'm dumb. The only things I was passing anyway were auto mechanics and gym. You're not dumb. Yeah, I am. Shut up and I'll tell you something. Don't tell Derry though. Okay. I think I'm gonna marry Sandy. After she gets out of school and I get a better job and everything, I might wait till you get out of school though, so I can still help Derry with the bills and stuff. Tough enough. Wait till I get out though, so you can keep Derry off my back. Don't be like that, kid. I told you, he don't mean half of what he says. You in love with Sandy? What's it like? Hmm, he sighed happily. It's real nice. In that moment, his breathing was light and regular. I turned my head to look at him, and in the moonlight, he looked like some Greek god came to earth. I wondered how he could stand being so handsome. Then I sighed. I didn't quite get what he meant about Derry. Derry thought I was just another mouth to feed and somebody to holler at. Derry love me? I thought of those hard, pale eyes. Soda was wrong for once, I thought. Derry doesn't love anyone or anything, except maybe Soda. I didn't hardly think of him as being human. I don't care, I lied to myself. I don't care about him either. Soda's enough, and I'd have him until I got out of school. I don't care about Derry, but I was still lying, and I knew it. I lied to myself all the time, but I never believed me. Interesting. So that is the end of chapter one. We definitely learned a little bit about the setting. Um, we learned a lot about all of these different characters, which hopefully um, you hit pause and then took some time to kind of fill out a chart or make some notes about our different characters and their character descriptions, their character traits. Um, but we're also learning a lot about the dynamic between Pony Boy, Soda, and Dairy as far as that tension that's there between Pony Boy and Dairy, but also that closeness that's there between Soda and Pony Boy. So think about how that makes Pony Boy feel, maybe how Dairy feels, how Soda feels kind of being in the middle of all of this. There's all this conflict going on with the socials, this other gang, and we're going to see if that grows and that increases um, and what becomes of that as far as the plot. Um, we learned a lot of information in that chapter. So hopefully um, you wrote down, took some notes. Um, if we were face-to-face -face in class, we would definitely have much deeper further discussion. Um, but if you are watching this and you have some comprehension questions to answer, why don't you go ahead and work on those now? And if you have any questions, leave them in the comments of this video and I will try to get back to you as quickly as I can. So thanks for watching chapter one of The Outsiders by Essie Hinton.